we continue our lecture on amino acids and protein and now we come to covering the last topic or last objective which is protein structure now the first protein structure that uh, we, we need to cover is called the primary structure and a primary structure is basically the sequence of amino acid in a protein chain. Uh, I want you to imagine this in your mind. The old-fashioned telephone cords kind of ball up into a ball of twisted cord. But if you were to take that cord and uh, hold it in both hands and stretch it out straight, that is the primary sequence of amino acid. So the primary sequence of amino acids is just the order of amino acids from left to right in the protein structure. It has nothing to do with functionality. The left-hand side is the amino N. The right-hand side is the carboxyl N. Now, if you were to look at this protein right here, which is the structure of uh, ribonuclease. You have the N terminus, which is K or lysine, and the C terminus at 124, which is V or valine. So the N terminus on the left hand side is lysine, the C terminus on the right hand side is valine. And the order from lysine all the way to valine is the sequence of amino acids, which is the primary structure of amino acid. The, uh, and again, let me back up. The primary sequence of amino acid, these amino acids are strung uh, together by a uh, peptide bond between the alpha uh, carboxyl and the alpha amino group of adjacent amino acids to make up this chain of uh, primary structure. The secondary structure is that imagine that the straight chain begins to take on some forms. And so one of them, one of the, uh, uh, the secondary structure of amino acids are held together by hydrogen bond between carboxyl or carbonyl carbon C double bond O and NH on different amino acids within the uh, protein chain. Uh, one of the first structure, uh, secondary structure of protein is called the alpha helix. Alpha helix is basically a helix where that is held together by hydrogen bonds. Again, this is uh, alpha helix is that the R groups are all extended to the outside. The helix makes a full turn every 3.6 amino acids. And the helix is right-handed. It, it twists in a uh, clockwise direction. The carbonyl group C double bond of each peptide bond extends parallel to the axis of the helix and points directly at the NH or the amino group of the peptide bond four amino acids below it in the helix. A hydrogen bond is formed between them. Now, you remember we discussed hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is an attractive force that occurs between two electronegative atoms or two electro electron rich atoms on which hydrogen is bound to one of them. And so hydrogen is the one that is involved in that attractive force. The type of bonds that are involved in holding this together is all hydrogen bonds between carbonyl, uh, the C double bond or oxygen, and the amino group on, uh, uh, that are four amino acids uh, apart.
this is the uh, structure of the alpha helix and uh, uh, they say that it kind of reminds you of a toilet paper roll and this is so true that alpha helix is right-handed and it uh, it kind of goes like this and it looks like a uh, the core of a toilet paper right here it has an amino end and it has a carboxy end and this is the structure uh, going clockwise right here of the alpha helix right here that are held together by peptide bond between C double bond or an amino group. Another secondary structure is beta sheet. Uh, they call it the uh, beta pleated sheet. And their flattened structure right here that are either going parallel, which means um, one chain will go amino to carboxyl, the other chain amino to carboxyl, or anti-parallel. One goes from carbo uh, amino to carboxyl, the other one is carboxyl to amino. And they're oriented side by side in a way that carbon double bond O and NH group are oriented toward each other, and there's an attractive force between this oxygen and this hydrogen or nitrogen to form a hydrogen bond. They're adjacent to the point where every few amino acids, there is a hydrogen bond between the C double bond O and NH on the different chains. Again, this is just different organization of the beta sheet. Uh, they can be anti-parallel right here, and they have stacking effect or parallel pointing in all kinds of direction right here or they can be mixed anti-parallel parallel anti-parallel anti but the interaction between these separate chains is through the hydrogen bond again this is just a depiction of the beta sheet you have two sheets laying side by side and you have hydrogen bond between them or they can have these following structures right here uh, they're all laid out flat and adjacent to each other and they can begin to form hydrogen bond uh, between the chains so we go from primary structure that has peptide bond holding amino acids together to secondary structure that had hydrogen bond holding alpha helix and the beta sheet together. Then we come to tertiary structure. Now, tertiary structure is the three-dimensional structure of the protein that it has in order for that protein to be functional. Okay? Now, you remember that we have uh, uh, the secondary structure that are uh, consists of helix and beta sheet. Now, uh, tertiary structure is held together by a number of bonds. Hydrogen bond, same one that discuss, we discussed in the secondary structure. Electrostatic interaction, this is interaction between plus and minus. Hydrophobic uh, and van der Waals forces, these are weak forces that occurs between, uh, uh, let's say, hydrophobic interaction right here. In fact, hydrogen bonding is also classified as a van der Waals forces. But just look at this way. Hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interaction, and hydrophobic interaction is interaction between two hydrophobic groups. And then you have the disulfide bridges or disulfide bond. These are covalent bond between two cysteine residues where the sulfurs interact to form a very uh, a bond, a strong bond. Uh, protein folds into alpha and beta conformations that are linked by bridging sequences. Uh, the R groups are held together uh, by hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bridges, ionic interaction, and hydrogen bonding that we alluded to already. This gives the protein its three-dimensional shape, uh, and it is this shape that causes the protein to be functional. Now, this is an example of what a tertiary structure of a protein uh, looks like. 
it has in here uh, helix right here and they have loops and they may have beta sheet right here it's not very clear on here but you can see that loops uh, I mean uh, helix right here and then you have beta sheet flatten right here you have helix again and then you have sheet so you have a mixture of uh, alpha helix you have beta sheet and you have loops where it doesn't involve either alpha helix or beta sheet and so you can uh, uh, clump these together in a three-dimensional shape that causes this protein to be functional and it is that shape that the protein must fold into that's the native state in order for it to be functional it is held together by hydrogen bond electrostatic interaction hydrophobic interaction and disulfide bridges finally we come to the quaternary structure of the protein and quaternary structure refers to a structure of a protein where two or more of the tertiary structures of proteins interact to form a functional unit of a multi multimeric protein. They're held together by forces that are found in the tertiary structure, hydrogen bonding, disulfide bonds, ionic interactions, and hydrophobic interaction. And this is an example. You have uh, uh, this uh, tertiary structure, you have beta sheet, you have loops right here, you have helix right here, again you have beta sheet, you have loops, and you have uh, helix right here. They're all mixed to form a three-dimensional structure in green and another three-dimensional structure in blue that interact together to form a dimer of an enzyme that is functional only in a dimer form. Okay. Now, interaction between these consists of hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interaction, disulfide bridge, and hydrophobic interaction right here. And so this quaternary structure makes up a functional unit that consists of two or more subunits of proteins. And that concludes our lecture on amino acid and protein.